and uh, who helped coordinate today. And for everybody who's going to present, taking time out of your day, we've got a lot of people here with very, very busy schedules, and I very much appreciate your, your taking the time to appear today. Uh, the order for presentations are going to be very similar to what you would see is if you were a parent who comes into the dependency system. Uh, we're going to start with an area administrator from the Division of Children and Family Services, Don Cooper. Don used to be the area administrator for our Child Protective Services Unit and is now in our CFWS unit here in Region 5 in Pierce County. Uh, following Don Cooper with DCFS will be Judge Katherine Nelson. Uh, she'll talk about the bench's involvement in dependency cases when she first sees cases and kind of the view from the bench on how these cases uh, work here in Pierce County. And I will say every county is a little bit different. This presentation today is really geared towards Pierce County and how we do things in Pierce County, which is better than any place else in the state, I think. Um, next, we'll have uh, law enforcement speak. Uh, Detective Gary Sanders will talk to us a little bit about when law enforcement gets involved uh, in this process and how we work cooperatively with law enforcement to protect kids here in Pierce County. Uh, I'll be presenting on behalf of the Attorney General's office uh, in our role. Deborah McFadden is here from the Department of Assigned Counsel with Pierce County. Deb has been representing parents here in Pierce County for a long time and is very, very good at it and very well respected in our community. I'm really glad she's here. Uh, Julie Lowry, who's head of our Guardian Ad Litem program, again, a lot of experience, worked with literally thousands of kids uh, here in Pierce County and really has a good perspective, I think, on how kids are impacted by the dependency process and the court process. Uh, Sherry Novak, of course. Uh, Sherry also appears in our Dependency 101 video that's shown to parents. Uh, she has fostered, boy, I would hate to guess how many kids she's fostered, but as the foster parent liaison for Region 5, she's the person, kind of the go-to person who represents foster parents here in this area, and um, she really knows the system very well and can tell us how foster parents help in this process, not only how they help, but also how they help reunite families uh, very often, I think, here in Pierce County or, or work towards uh, other permanent plans with folks uh, as an adoptive parent. Uh, Paula Strickland is here. Paula's great. Um, Paula does the street level work like the social workers, but she's a private provider. Uh, we send Paula into our most difficult cases here in Pierce County. She actually goes into people's homes and she works with them hands on, trying to help people who may have parental deficiencies. Well, they do have parental deficiencies. They've been identified by the court. And Paula is assigned to go out and work hands on with folks on correcting those. Paula is really great. She has as much coffee as I do in any given day and uh, has a lot of energy and is really respected by the parents she works with. And one of the reasons we often recommend Paula is um, she reunites families and helps in that goal. Very happy to have Pam Gideon here because I think the tribal perspective is incredibly important. Uh, Pam will talk a little bit about in her role as the attorney for the Puyallup tribe, uh, not only the sovereign nation of Indian tribes here in the state of Washington and the United States, but also the role of the Indian Child Welfare Act and the importance of the tribes being involved in cases that involve Indian children early and how we can work cooperatively with tribal uh, social workers and attorneys. And finally, um, Paula is here. Pauline Ross is here from the Parent to Parent program. We're going to close with her today, and she's going to talk a little bit about her perspective as a parent who went through this process, what worked well, maybe what didn't, and also to emphasize the importance of this parent to parent program that we have here in Pierce County, which I really think has helped engage parents more quickly in this process and has probably reduced some of the distrust and the drama that comes in these cases. So I'm very grateful for her to coming on fairly short notice actually today. So thank you very much. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand the microphone over to Don Cooper to talk about uh, the DCFS role in dependency cases. Thank you, Julian. I printed this off this morning and realized I didn't use big enough font, so I may be going back and forth with my glasses a little bit. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the two main programs that are part of Children's Administration, CPS and CWS. Um, Child Protective Services um, is kind of our upfront uh, program piece within Children's Administration. We investigate allegations of abuse or neglect and we assess immediate safety threats and risk to children. We have a countywide protocol that we've actually had in place probably since the mid-80s that 
directs how we are to work together in investigating uh, abuse and neglect referrals. It probably um, became more of an operational and functional protocol 10 years ago when we opened our Children's Advocacy Center and started to really work as true partners in um, staffing and sharing these cases. Um, that CAC, the Children's Advocacy Center, is located over at Mary Bridge Children's Hospital, and they're a big player in, um, in our work to keep children safe in Pierce County. Um, as we investigate referrals, we're also assessing whether children can safely remain in their parents' care. When we feel that they can, we may also feel they need services, and we may offer that outside of the um, forum of juvenile court. Um, just as sort of a backdrop, some, I'm not going to throw a lot of numbers at you, but I had to come with a few because we're a bureaucracy, right? Um, so far in 2009, we've investigated 3,150 referrals um, in CPS. Um, of those, about 75% we were able to close out shortly after investigation. Um, and then about 12% ended up getting moved on to our voluntary service unit they work with families voluntarily. Most of those kids are at home and they're working to try to maintain those kids in their own homes. And that remaining 13% are the families that we feel are of sufficient risk and um, need, in need of juvenile court structure. And those are the families that you know we're going to be talking about more today. One of the myths I think that is out there is you know around how children come into care. And a lot of people think that CPS has the authority to walk into people's homes and remove kids um, any old time we want to. And that's, that's not the case. And I want to provide a little clarification about how children come into care. Um, one of the ways and one of the most um, common ways is through protective custody. That's a law enforcement action. It's only initiated by law enforcement in this state. Um, it's done on a threshold that they apply, which is fairly high. Um, I believe their threshold is, you know, risk of imminent harm to children. Gary may talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's a high threshold, and it's not something that's done um, frivolously. Oftentimes we consult with them on that, but they're the folks that are making that final decision. The protective custody lasts only 72 hours, and so we're at a point then they move custody over to us, and we're at a place where we have to decide can the children safely go home and if not can um, can we look what are we going to do about um, having a legal structure for the children to remain in out-of-home care um, the options at that point are um, twofold one is we sometimes do negotiate voluntary placement agreements with families those are families where we think a short-term placement out of home um, might be sufficient to um, reduce risk and improve safety in the home. We um, generally, those are not more than about 90 days in duration. And generally, they're done with parents that really we think can um, remediate the issues in a fairly short window of time. Um, the other um, option we have is to file a juvenile, um, a petition in juvenile court. That, um, that's also done with a fair amount of oversight. It's not just a social worker walking into court and presenting this order and making that happen. Those petitions are drafted by social workers, they're reviewed by supervisors, they're reviewed by an attorney general, and then they're reviewed by the judicial officer at court. And there are times that they get kicked back along the way, either for more information or because they're not sufficient. So again, I hope I'm painting a picture of a system that has a lot of checks and balances when it comes to removing children from their homes. Um, once we remove children, we are required to notify parents of all upcoming court hearings, and we also give them information about how to apply for an attorney through the Department of Assigned Counsel. Um, when children come into care, there's two primary forms of placement that we use. One is obviously foster care. That's you know also referred to as stranger care. It's care with people that are not related to the children. They are licensed and approved through um, another arm of Children's Administration. And then the other form is relative care. We, um, I think, are pretty fortunate in Region 5 to have 40% of our children are in relative care. And that's 
a pretty high rate, I think, statewide, and I think it's something we can be proud of here. We um, clear relatives carefully, criminal background checks, checks for abuse and neglect history. We walk through their homes. We assess their ability to um, parent children, their, their grandchildren or nieces and nephews, and we offer ongoing support to them. Um, once cases are filed on, they move pretty quickly from the CPS world to CWS, to Child and Family Welfare Services. Um, those workers have a lot on their plate. They're tasked with the well-being and safety of children throughout the life of the case, and they're also tasked with moving the case to permanence in a timely manner. Um, they work closely with parents, um, with the children, with foster parents, caregivers, and with a number of other parties that you'll hear about later on this afternoon. Um, we assess parents on a couple of different levels. One is um, two levels, progress and compliance. Uh, progress means that we're providing services to parents and we're able to see them demonstrate that they're learning something from it. When Paula's working with somebody, you know, we're asking her, what are the parents getting out of the service? Can you see a change? Or are they complying, which is another form of progress, but it's not exactly what we're looking for. That's going to parenting classes, but maybe not really um, being able to translate what they learn in a class into real life practice. Um, and finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about what permanency planning is. We have some fairly um, rigorous guidelines around permanency planning for children. We have federal requirements we have to meet. And from the minute children come into care, we should be making, you know, working on permanent plans for children. Um, in almost all of the situations, our first permanent plan is reunification. So, you know, parents almost always, uh, there's very rare and unusual situations when that isn't the initial permanent plan. Um, and so we're, our first efforts are to um, help parents get their children back home. We do that through service delivery and while we're not providing the services directly, we case manage the service delivery, we um, make referrals and we pay for a large amount of those services to happen. And as parents complete services, um, and these are all court-ordered services, we're reporting back to the court. And at some point, we ultimately ask for the court to um, approve the children going home. So again, that's not an isolated social work decision. That's a decision made with other parties um, and with the, the court's blessing. Once kids go home, we monitor the case for no less than six months before we decide whether we can actually safely walk away from that family. Um, another common permanent plan is adoption. That's um, when we get to a point in a case where we feel like we're not able to safely return these kids home. We've maybe, um, parents aren't doing services, they're not making progress. Sometimes parents actually relinquish rights to their children because they feel it's in their best interest to do so. Those are the situations in which we're pursuing adoption. Um, that's a legally, um, it, it's a legal process that permanently severs the ties between parent and child and it's something that you know we look look at very seriously but it does make a child um, what we call legally free and then available to be adopted by an adoptive parent that's been uh, that's been screened and, and studied um, once those adoptions occur the underlying dependency process is over and that and those folks are recognized as the, the legal parents of that child from that point on the other two types of permanent plans that we do to a lesser degree are guardianships and non-parental custody. Um, those are done oftentimes with older children who maybe have attachments to their parents and perhaps adoption is not the best plan or when relative um, caregivers aren't comfortable with adoption and maybe uh, non-parental custody is a, a more appropriate plan to go with. Um, as you hear from other presenters today, I think you'll see that our work is not done in a vacuum. Most of the decisions we make about children are, are made with the collaboration of many of the people in this room. And um, I think that's a great way of having a check and balance system and ensuring that, that as a system we're doing together what we need to um, meet the needs of children and families in Pierce County. Thank you. 
I'm Katherine Nelson, and I'm a Pierce County S Superior Court judge. And I guess the theme of my little talk here is the buck stops here. And what I mean by that is, as mentioned by Don, um, the uh, court is the oversight that decides whether or not the petition to bring the children into the care of the state even temporarily for a three-day period um, is going to be granted or not. So again, the image of a social worker walking into somebody's house and taking the kids away um, without anybody else checking or knowing anything about it is just not true. That formal legal documents are prepared and they are reviewed very carefully by the judge or the commissioner assigned out here at juvenile court. And if there is not reasonable cause to believe that the petition, or if it doesn't meet this very low standard, but it must meet the standard, then the petition will be rejected and either resubmitted with more accurate or more detailed information or perhaps some, another route will be chosen. Um, that is the same scenario that happens all along the dependency process. And judges get involved at the time of shelter care where parents can have a hearing or a trial on whether or not their children remain in the jurisdiction or the custody of the state and where they're placed and what visitation should be. And then there's an adjudication as to whether or not the children are actually dependent children. And that is determined within 75 days and sooner than that in most cases. Um, and then you, uh, the court monitors the case and uh, the progress of the children. And they do that um, more frequently at first and then depending on each case. But always it is within um, six months um, of the previous review. Um, if the family is not reuniting, an entire new legal proceeding is filed, which is a petition for termination, and the judge uh, presides over the stages of that judicial proceeding as well. So, um, and in guardianships, one of the permanent plans that was mentioned, the judge reviews that. In Pierce County, we continue to review those guardianships um, yearly until the child reaches the age of majority. Um, when children are getting to be 18 years old and the court is not no longer going to be supervising them as juveniles, the court has a role in ensuring that each of those children have services made available to them to prepare them for independent living. Um, we have many other roles along the way to ensure that the laws that have been enacted by the state and other uh, laws that apply from the federal government and timelines happen. Um, it's a big job, and it's especially a big job um, when a judge must spend virtually all of the working hours on the bench making the decisions. And so um, the Washington State Legislature did a very wonderful thing uh, about a year ago, and they um, provided us with some court improvement grant money. So for the last year or so, it's the first time that Pierce County has had a staff member that can help us uh, improve our system. We have had a reasonable effort symposium, and we've had many good changes grow out of that, but now we have a staff person that can help us improve systematically um, our timelines and our oversight with respect to children. The last thing I want to say is I'm very, very grateful for all of the players here at Pierce County because I do believe that each and every year we've made significant improvements to focus our efforts on being family friendly on um, getting the best results for children. And we've only been able to do that because all of the different representatives that are going to speak today 
have worked very hard to collaborate together to make these improvements. And I'm talking about giving up their lunch hours several times a week to meet together and to talk about issues and to improve our system. And I'm extremely proud at, of at all the gains we've been making over the last few years that I've been able to witness it. And I think there are judges here that have been involved a lot longer than I and can attest to the same thing. So there's always more to do. No system is entirely perfect, but I really feel we've made wonderful advances and I'm excited about continuing that progress. And again, I have to thank uh, legislators like <laughs> Representative Keggy, who's here today, that's been forward thinking enough to help us um, with um, having some administrative time to really work on these issues. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our representative from the police department. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'll be the representative from law enforcement on, this, on our role of placement of children, dependency, and um, what goes into that on our part. Um, like Don Cooper said, we're the ones with the legal authority to place children. Um, uh, we're given that, and it's, it's a strong guideline that we have to go by. Usually it's by neglect or abuse that we take these children into um, custody and put them through dependency and so forth. And it's a very important decision that we have to make because we are, as we talk about the family, we're disrupting that family. These kids don't know who, you know, who we are. We come in there, um, I'm a little more plain clothed today than our field officers and stuff who are in big uniforms, big get belts, guns, and everything like that. And it kind of can be slightly intimidating, and we're breaking up that family. So we've got to make sure that we're very, um, very, make a very sound judgment when we do take these children. Um, and the way that this comes about, either from the law enforcement side of the f uh, field officer who goes out to a welfare check, of a daughter or um, a neighbor calls in says these kids are always dirty or I heard screams coming from the house beside us or something like that. When we go out there and we witness, you know, go to the house, check on the children and there does appear to be a, a sign of abuse or neglect and that's when we um, call upon and begin the dependency process and that's when we call on DCFS. Um, they're our saviors. Um, you know, we can bring them out. They're real child friendly. Um, call for a social worker. They come out and we can place them. So it's a very huge team effort here. Um, and then it also goes um, as far as me being a detective within the special assault unit. I deal with child abuse, sex crimes, um, things of that nature. And so maybe it is through a social worker calls and says, hey, we need to go out to this house. We've got a referral um, through CPS. It hasn't come in through 911 or anything but we need to go out and check on these children. And then maybe a safety interview is done. And then from there, we move on and it becomes a criminal investigation and so forth. Um, and also that, that goes into play in the team is that although we work with DCFS, we work with the prosecutor, we work with judges, we work with, we work with so many people and it, it's a great team to be on. Um, like I said, unification of a family but also protecting the kids which is the most important. Um, it's a cruel fate, you know, the cards you get dealt at life of mom and dad. You know, you get the doctor and the stay-at-home mom or do you get the crack user and the we're non-existent father. So um, we need to step in and, and take that role. So by law enforcement, we, um, we do that and we work collaboratively. Um, and it's kind of passed on from there, from either investigation point or the patrol side where we go out and we place these children in the custody. But then also, um, after the field officer goes and uh, places the child and calls and we have someone put in a placement, either foster care or however it may be with the family, uh, family members um, that are safe, and then um, it can come down to us and on the criminal matter, it's uh, the investigation, whether mom, dad, whoever is the um, suspect needs to be criminally charged and what routes we need to go there. And then that part from the criminal investigations to part where I work, it becomes very important because um, we work so well with, the, like Don mentioned, the Children's Advocacy Center. It's a great thing. We have staffings every Friday. We talk about cases. It's kind of an open forum. We can kind of throw things out and bounce things off people. You know, this isn't working for me. I'm not getting through this family or what kind of, what, who do you think I can contact to do this? And it's just, it's a gamma or a, a wide 
um, I guess, a large pool that we have to pull resources. You know, you have prosecutors, other um, social workers, other detectives, and it goes um, very collaborative together. And also at the CAC, we do uh, forensics interviews where the children are interviewed um, forensically with uh, by a, chain, a trained child interviewer, and um, and we go proceed through there. So and then there's some mental health uh, options for the children, and then other things. So. For law enforcement, it's kind of, we're the bad guys, we come in, we take the kids, um, but it's, when we do that, it's, it's because of the abuse and because of neglect, and we have to think about the family almost, you know, what decision we're going to make, and we want to keep the children safe. So that's our part as law enforcement. So. Thanks very much, Detective. So again, I'm Julian Bray. I'm with the Attorney General's office. Um, in my office, we have about 11 attorneys uh, who handle dependencies and termination of parental rights cases in Pierce County. Uh, our office is located in downtown Tacoma. Uh, we're moving. We're going to stay within downtown Tacoma. We are people who live in the Pierce County area, a lot of us here in Tacoma. And in fact, it's been one of the highlights of my career. I, I work in a family drug court. When I actually see people who I've worked with who've been through this system working at Target or shopping at Target right with me, so living as part of this community, I've really seen how this system works to uh, help people get their lives back, because really that's what we're working with here uh, in dependency court. It was Judge Frank Cuthbertson, another one of our elected Superior Court judges, who said dependency court isn't a punish parents court, it's a keep kids safe court. And I think if we keep that as our mission statement, and I, we have a very good bench who keeps that focus, we're focused on the health, safety, and welfare of kids, uh, and we do it within the constitutional framework that we have here in the state of Washington. Um, as a team leader here in Pierce County, I supervise five lawyers who do nothing but five days a week, hopefully only four days a week, but sometimes five, come here and handle shelter care hearings. So we have hearings here every single day where families are being broken apart. We understand that. Uh, and we do our very, very best on behalf of Rob McKenna and the citizens of the state of Washington to make sure that people's rights are protected, to make sure people, parents who come into this system are hooked up with attorneys through the Department of Assigned Counsel, and in fact that people's rights aren't being violated. That's the one thing when I explain to people if they have questions about this system, is it's not done in a black hole. We are open courtrooms now in the state of Washington. Anyone can come. I remember when we opened our courtrooms a few years ago, we thought there would be press, we thought there'd be family members, we thought there'd be a million people show up, and in fact, nobody came. So it's wonderful to have, you know, Representatives Kagi and Morell here, you know, both offices present, and, and Representative Kagi here, to, uh, to hear that we are, in fact, we welcome you to come to our courtroom anytime. Uh, we're, we're always open, uh, 9 to 5. Um, <laughs> My office gets involved in cases we advise, as the Attorney General's office, we advise the Department of Social and Health Services. We get involved frequently before cases are filed. In fact, we review all the, the new court actions that are filed, taking kids out of the home. We review those petitions for legal sufficiency. So by the time they make it to the judge, they've not only been vetted by the social worker, their supervisor, but also by somebody in my office and maybe two people, and then they get to the judge. So there are a lot of eyes on these cases before kids are ever removed from parents' homes, unless law enforcement finds them in a situation that's clearly child abuse or neglect, in which case they have the authority to place children without a court order. Uh, my office stays involved in these cases from the shelter care hearing all the way until the cases are dismissed with the permanent plans that Don was talking about. So we're frequently involved in these cases. You know, I've got kids of kids, because I'm old enough now, who've come into the system and then had their own kids. Uh, but we're involved with a family sometimes for two, three years. Uh, we're working on shortening those time frames to permanence for kids so that they're either getting home sooner or we're finding an alternate permanent plan. And I think the department's making a very concerted effort at that, as is the court right now, in making sure that if kids are out of the home in that window of 12 to 15 months, we're getting a termination petition filed if that's what we need to do. And that's my office's role. Um, we file the termination petitions. We take these cases to court. It's our role representing the state of Washington. I always tell social workers, we don't represent you, social worker A, B, or C. We represent the state of Washington. And our specific client here is the Department of Social and Health Services, but we also represent the citizens of the state of Washington. So part of our role, if we see that something needs to be corrected, if the department isn't doing their job, 
Um, I know Don wants to know about it, and Nancy Sutton, the regional administrator, but we also need to know because we're the ones standing front and center facing Judge Nelson when she says, why wasn't this service provided? We have to answer articulately on behalf of the state as to why it wasn't. We don't like to be in that situation. So we work to monitor that the department is, in fact, complying with the court order uh, as the defense attorney does with their client, the parent, in these cases. Uh, my message consistently when I go out and talk to parents at this Dependency 101 group that we have uh, twice a month, twice a month, you're always welcome to come, my message is get involved in services early. Get involved in services often. Stop fighting the system. When we get folks into the family drug court program, which is where I work, that's a voluntary program, and that's when people, I see the light turn on with folks once they say, okay, I'm, I'm mad at DSHS, I'm not going to move in with them, but I'm going to take advantage of some of these services because there's probably a reason that there's a police officer in my home and my kids are being taken out of my care. And it is amazing to me, and I know the judges can say they've seen this, the light just goes on. And you say, hallelujah, we're going to move forward in this case. So I tell parents, get involved early in these cases. Uh, here in Pierce County, we have a family drug court program as well as a felony drug court program. We have about 70 to 80 parents who are involved in our dependency system. We're the largest family drug court in the northwest of the United States. I'm very proud of that fact. And we have a success rate of getting kids home uh, that's about 10 to 15 percent higher from the last statistics I saw through this Health and Human Services grant of getting kids home sooner because these are parents who voluntarily engage in uh, intensive enhanced drug and alcohol services and those are available through uh, those cases are reviewed here at Raymond Hall they're also reviewed downtown by Judge Gary Steiner uh, Judge Tom Larkin who's seated right here was one of the founders of that drug court program we're very grateful for that and he's going to come back next year and work with us here in dependency court uh, we've been very lucky here in Pierce County at the number of judges we have we have elected superior court judges who are hearing our dependency cases in addition to commissioners which is wonderful because when people if I get comments you know who is this person hearing my case I can say that's Judge Catherine Nelson she is an elected superior court judge and I think it adds an air of gravity to this proceeding that these are the folks who hear the most important cases and these dependency cases are the most important cases um, we do have increasing case loads here in Pierce County I think every other county in the state of Washington as I understood it last year actually had a reduction in dependency filings here in Pierce County we're up about 17 percent that has an impact on my office but I'll tell you the folks who work with the Attorney General's office and Rob McKenna here in Pierce County are doing a great job uh, we're working the lunch hours and the weekends getting these cases prepared to go to trial in a timely manner because we know that justice delayed if you put off justice in these cases and if people want to contest the state having their kids, they need to get to hearing soon because nothing happens in these cases when everybody's fighting. Things only happen when everybody's sitting at the table together. And the only way to get people sitting at the table together, one of the great ways is meaningful court hearings. Every judge that we have here today uh, takes part in what I would call meaningful court hearings, meaning they listen to the parents. There's a sense that they actively are engaging with them, and it's kind of like motivational interviewing, if, if you're familiar with that. What's your goal? Where do you want to be? Who's driving the train here? Is it me as the judge? You know, Judge Larkin does a brilliant job with that. Judge Nelson and Judge Grant do great jobs with that. These parents who come into this system, they're individuals just like me, I know that. And the only way they're going to get their kids back is if they address what brought their kids into care. So our goal, my goal as the Attorney General's office, is to, within the framework of the law, work to get kids home safely uh, and soon. And to make sure people's rights are protected. Because the system, if people's rights aren't being protected, there's no legitimacy to the system. And I know that. And ultimately, if we terminate a kid's parental rights, a parent's parental rights, I know that's forever. And that's one of those fundamental liberty interests that's protected by the Constitution. It's the civil equivalent of the death penalty, I always tell people. And it sounds a little scary, but it's true. We're actually taking steps that will have meaning to these folks for the rest of their lives. Um, and with that, I do want to thank the judges who are here today. Judge Beverly Grant uh, and Judge Nelson have been our judges for the past two years. And past year here in Pierce County, Judge Larkin has been intimately involved in our Juvenile Executive Committee. Uh, and is, I'm grateful to have him back, Judge Kitty Ann Van Dornick, 
um, who hears a lot of our cases and hangs on to them, which is great, because she knows the cases. We have judges who keep cases to follow them to ensure success for these kids. And also our new commissioner, Diane Key, so I'm very glad that she's here and she's had experience in the past working with these, those. I hope I didn't miss anybody. So thanks very much. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Deb McFadden. And the hardest job in the business. The most unappreciated. <laughs> I'm Deb McFadden. I am an attorney with the Department of Assigned Counsel. We represent the parents and the dependency actions. Um, dependency is one of the very few areas in which there is a right to court-appointed counsel if a person can't afford to hire an attorney. Um, we get involved right off the bat at the shelter care hearing, regardless of whether a parent has been determined indigent or not. Um, we come and cover shelter cares on a rotating basis every day. Um, kind, of, kind of as a courtesy to the court, otherwise they would all have to be set over while the parent got screened, and that doesn't really serve anybody's interest. And in fact, most of the parents on whom petitions are filed do qualify for court-appointed counsel. So we try and facilitate that right off the bat, and also I think that it's good for them to come in and have the opportunity right at the initial stages of the proceedings to speak with an attorney. Um, Oftentimes they're upset and angry and emotional. Um, maybe they're still using, uh, if drugs and alcohol are an issue, they're probably still using at that point. Um, probably a pretty good reason if you're a drug user, if somebody takes your kids, that you know, maybe you're going to go out and use at that point. Um, but we try and provide that ear uh, to them right off the bat, as well as explain to them what the purpose of that shelter care hearing is and what their options are and that they can contest that or they can agree to the temporary out-of-home placement with of their children either in foster care or in relative placement. We talk to them about whether there are any possible relative placements about which the social worker is not aware and we just try and provide them some report some support in the early going. Um, we do, with the help of our veteran parents, uh, have paperwork filled out to determine whether they're eligible for court-appointed counsel. Um, as I said, generally they are. The judge will sign an order appointing an attorney, and then it, that will eventually make its way to our office for appointment of a counsel. Um, we try and keep the same attorney on board who did the shelter care hearing, if at all possible, so that the parent has some continuity. At that stage of the proceedings, um, there's an AG of the day out there. They have a court filing worker that they probably have not met until the day of the shelter care hearing um, because of the way the department transfers their cases. And so we try and provide some continuity there and keep the same attorney on it, if at all possible. Um, when I do the Dependency 101 presentations, I really try to get through to the parents, much like Julian said, that you've got to get involved early. The clock is ticking right from the beginning, and it takes a while to complete the services that generally will wind up being ordered. Um, I also try and convey to the parents that, you know, we understand that they're angry, and we understand that a lot of times they feel it was unjust that the child was removed from their care. And they can stay mad, but they can still be mad at the termination hearing where their parental rights are being terminated because they could never move past that to do the services. And that's really where the cases are successful, I think we would all agree, um, are where even if the parent felt perhaps that the initial removal of the child was not just, that once that dependency is established, they accept that and avail themselves of the services that have been recommended by the department and the guardian ad litem and which have been ordered by the court. And it gives me comfort to be able to assure my clients that if they do those services and if they make progress and remedy the parental deficiencies that brought their child under the um, dependency statute, they will get their child back. And I think that's something that parents need to hear. And uh, I know that Judge Larkin, um, in particular, is a great one for saying, you know, who, who's going to determine this? And the clients oftentimes don't know how to answer. Um, and then he tells them, it's you. You determine it. You decide. Um, 
So we represent them throughout the dependency process unless we uh, lose contact with them and then we will set a motion to withdraw. We represent them through the termination hearing if there is one. Um, but I really think that our role and, you know, the views expressed here may not be those of the Department of Sign Council um, or the <laughs> other panel attorneys, but I have been doing this for almost 24 years, um, which says something about me, but I probably don't want to know what. Um, but they, oh, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> too much, too much of a preamble. Um, they want their kids back. They love their kids. Even, I have had very, very few clients over the years that I haven't genuinely liked, that haven't genuinely loved their own children. They may recognize that they can't get their child back, but they, they want to do what's best. And a lot of times they just need some hand-holding, and I think that that's part of our job, is to kind of run that interference. I always tell the parents of Dependency 101, you know, let the attorney be the bad guy. We like that. We'll do that. Let us call the department. If you're having a problem with your social worker, call us. If you're not getting your visitation, call us. You know, don't you take it on with the social worker. You need to have a good working relationship with them. And I think that, you know, again, while not everybody has the same approach, I think most of us really agree that this is not a good area of law um, for there to be an adversarial relationship. They have to have a working relationship with their social worker and with the guardian ad litem and with their service providers. And I think as a parent attorney, we're not doing them any favors to set them up to not talk to the social worker unless we're present or, you know, to just have that adversarial posture. Now, sometimes the cases are going to go that way and that's just how it works. But I really try and encourage the parents to let me be the bad guy and let me fight that fight for them so that they can just focus on their services. And I think, you know, I think that that's what's really important. A lot of times they don't have family support. They don't have a sober network of friends. They're really starting from scratch in trying to turn around their life, and they rely on the support that they get not only from their counsel, but from their social workers, from their service providers like Paula, who I have to say, I was telling Pam, is the gold standard. She's the one provider everybody agrees on, and if Paula says it, it's true, period. <laughs> End of story. So... <laughs> I also want to just mention, because I have done this for a long time, and when I started doing this, um, we, the cases were heard by commissioners, and I think at that point it was really much more of kind of a just move them through, move them through. Um, and over the years, I think that my sense of it has been that with the judges being involved, with the judges hearing the cases, that the court has really become much more parent-friendly, like we talked about earlier, or somebody mentioned that. I think it's a huge difference now from when I started my practice here. Uh, I think the judges do listen to everything that's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that the rulings are consistently fair. I think the parents do feel that they've been heard. And I just can't overemphasize the importance of that. Um, I guess the only other thing is, you know, the parents need encouragement. They need it at every turn. And not just from us, not just from the social worker, not just from the bench, but from everybody they come in contact with. Because oftentimes they don't believe they can do it. And I think it's up to us to let them know that everybody's here working on their behalf. So... I'm Julie Lowry, and I supervise the CASA Guardian Ad Litem Program, or the Dependency Unit, here at Juvenile Court. Um, I've been doing this, uh, been in this business for 23 years now, I guess. I started as a CASA in 1986, um, which is kind of unbelievable that it's 23 years. Um, I was. Um, my unit has seven uh, probation officers who serve as guardians ad litem and five probation officers who serve as CASA coordinators, and they also have a small caseload of their own. We have about 235 active CASA volunteers. CASA, for those of you who don't know, stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate, 
and those are community members who are trained to advocate for the kids in the dependency system. So right about the time of shelter care is when we appoint either a CASA or a guardian ad litem to the case. If at all possible, I try to appoint a CASA because they have more time to focus on the individual child and family's needs. Um, a CASA will go out and do an independent investigation, not of the allegations to prove or disprove, but just to learn enough information about the child and the family in order to make good recommendations about what's in the child's best interest. So we are, um, the court appoints us um, by statute, it's required for a guardian ad litem unless the, the court um, decides not to. And in Pierce County, we're somewhat unusual because uh, in some of the other large counties like King and Snohomish, not every child gets an advocate. In Pierce County, essentially every child who comes into the dependency system will be assigned either a CASA or a guardian ad litem. Um, as I mentioned, it's pref preferable for a CASA to be assigned. My seven staff GALs have caseloads right now of about 90 kids that they're advocating for. Um, and the CASAs will generally have an average of about three kids. Um, last year, we served um, 1,854 kids um, during 2008. On any given day, we're advocating for about 1,250 kids. Um, the CASA's role really is to be independent and to, um, as I say, advocate for what's in the child's best interest. They're also to report to the court the child's expressed wishes. So that can be two different things. Often it is, especially with younger kids, they want to go home and they, they don't understand the safety dynamics. Um, so the CASA's and guardian ad litems are charged with um, representing both those to the court, what's in the child's best interest or what they believe to be is in the child's best interest, and then also the child's expressed wishes. Um, they're also charged with monitoring the court order, and um, that's monitoring the um, compliance with the court order not only by the parents but by the state, and to bring to the court's attention um, any time when the court's orders aren't being followed. Um, we have, we we do 10 trainings per year of uh, CASA volunteers, and I think last year we had 317 total CASA volunteers advocating for children. And then somebody brings me the babies. Um, my name is Sherry Novak. I've been doing foster care for almost 30 years. Um, got in it. Hi, Crystal. <laughs> um, got in it strictly to do foster care, never wanting to adopt, never intending to adopt. And I'm now working on my seventh adoption. So I didn't do that very well. Um, after six of them, I was old and tired, um, and so went to the fast track program that the department has, put those babies through quick, six, eight months, boom, they were out. That worked for a while. Um, and now I have a fast track baby that's four and a half years old and she's going to be my seventh adoption and then I'm done, 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 <laughs> done. Um, foster parenting has changed since I started. Um, it, it used to be the foster home, the foster parents were just kind of a separate entity. They never spoke to the parents. They were never involved in court hearings. Um, they had very little say. They had very little knowledge. Um, they just kind of took care of the kids. Um, that's changing and I'm pushing for that to change. I work a lot with my birth parents. Um, I think it's better for them, I think it's better for the kids, and I think it's better for me. Um, I think that more of my kids go home because of my relationship with the birth parents. I think more of my kids stay home and don't come back into the system because the parents know me and trust me. Um, I think 
that it's a good change. I think I'm pushing in my job, I'm pushing more of my foster parents to, to get involved with the birth parents. And talking about early engagement of the birth parents, I think there needs to be early engagements of the foster parents. I think they need to be there at shelter care. I think they need to meet the parents when the parents are confused and scared and worried about their kids. Um, I just had two little girls with me just for five days, darling little girls, only for five days. And when I took them to reunite with their dad, the first thing he did is got down and looked in their eyes and said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I thought, yeah, they're okay. They've been with me all weekend. Um, but he didn't know that. He didn't know me. He didn't, you know, he didn't know that they were okay that they had been fine the whole five days they were away from him. If we could have met early on, I think that would have been a good thing. Um, because of my involvement with the birth parents, I have open adoptions on all my kids. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in open adoptions. Um, I don't think it can hurt the kids to have more people love them and to know that more people love them. So. My job, about five years ago, I was approached by Foster Care Resource Network. Um, they had a position called Foster Parent Liaison, and I kind of work between the department and the foster parents. Um, for the new foster parents, it's a scary system for them, too, just like it is for the birth parents. It's confusing. There's a lot of people involved. They don't know what they can say and what they can't say. Um, so I try and work with them. And the older foster parents that have been doing this for a long time, aren't necessarily up on the new movement. You know, they're still kind of, some of them don't want to speak up. Some of them still are afraid of the birth parents. Um, they feel like they're doing enough just taking care of the kids. Well, it's not enough anymore. Maybe it was 20 years ago, but it's not enough anymore. And my best case was the 11th child of a woman and nobody thought she'd get her back. And we did daily visits for a year and she's home and her mother is in a master's program and so she's my hero but we did it together and and the social worker knew that I would do that and that's why that child was placed with me and so I think we need to get more foster parents involved earlier and more Thanks. speak so but I'll do the best I can to try to explain what I do anyway I'm a therapist and I am a provider for the state of Washington and I do a variety of services for the state but in particular I do what's a contract called family preservation services and after listening to everybody I now know I do really have the best job of all of you because I get to work directly with families very intimately I get to go into people's homes and spend you know hours every week with families working with them on you know whatever issues have managed to get them into the system now I also do CPS up front so like a CPS worker um, I was trying to see if any of them were here today but might refer me to a case a family that they're investigating or um, has had a lot of referrals but they're not filing on and they're hoping not to file on and I go in there and I try to work with them and identify kind of what are the issues, see if we can't sure that family up to avoid this whole process we've been talking about. So I think we have a fair amount of success in that too. I don't think a lot of people hear about the cases that don't come in the system because I got tons of them, tons of them. So I do probably like 50% upfront CPS, avoid placement, um, and then the other half is reunification, kind of what we've been talking about here. So I think, and I loved listening to this about foster parents, I think that's great, because I think really the biggest thing any of us do is engaging these parents. We have to hook the parents, we have to convince them that we're not the enemy, we're here to help them, and our goal really is to get their kids home, because I don't think any of us want to keep their kids. I know people think we want to keep their kids, but we don't want to keep their kids. I, and I know you don't, you got seven already. <laughs> you don't want to keep any more kids. You know, and I don't have any of them, but I don't want to keep any of them. So I think that's probably the biggest myth. 
And I think um, that everybody works together as a team. I think everybody here, we all know each other because we interface. And nobody makes a decision in a box. I mean, if a case has to be filed on that maybe I was working on, unfortunately, you know, it's my failure too if we didn't, if we have to file. But, you know, it's not like any one person makes a decision. You know, if I have a family that's just not getting it and we need court structure, it's I go to the worker and say, you know, we really have to do that. This, this family, there's risk there. It's not safe. We've got to do something. We have to take the kid, you know. Nobody likes to do that, but we have to. So um, I guess the other thing is no family is the same. You know, every family is individual. It's not a, you know, every family gets this. At least that's not the way I view it. I mean, every family has to be assessed individually, see what their needs are, and services to meet their needs. Um, you know, because every family is very individual. Just like we're all individuals, our families are. So I go in and I do, I, I always like to refer to myself as a jack of all traits because we do whatever it takes. I mean, I'm a therapist and I try to, you know, teach skills. If it's parenting, if they can't manage their kids, it's about basic parenting. If it's uh, couples co-parenting, if couples counseling, if it's family counseling, if it's teaching, you know, coping skills or anger management, you know, whatever it takes, you kind of do. And at the same time, I have the luxury, because I have this great contract, that if it's something, I have to help someone find a house, I get to do that. They can't, if they need housing, if they need to find resources, I get to do that. So I get to do whatever it is that will help my families. So anyway, and uh, that's what I do. So, okay, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> oh, I did. Thank you. I'm Pam Gideon. I'm an attorney with the Puyallup Tribe. I've been there since 1996 where I came as their public defender. And as their public defender, I represented parents who had had their children removed, much like uh, Deb's office does. And then in 2000, I went up to the law office and started out with a practice that was pretty general. I did a lot of uh, different cases, but as things got uh, more and more time consuming with children, my practice is solely uh, a children's advocacy um, and representing the tribe when children are taken away from the state or taken away from their children by the state for abuse and neglect. And one of the things about the Indian Child Welfare Act that's interesting, I think, is that it's only triggered when a state acts. If another parent uh, wants their children, the Indian Child Welfare Act does not apply. It's only when state action um, occurs. And I've had some interesting cases where uh, a judge has made a, a certain statement and that triggers the state action. But um, one of the things that that I think is interesting is I represent the tribe in every case in the state, in every county in the state where the children are removed. I've been to Iowa, I've been to Oregon, and I have cases in California. So it's, um, that's probably why my case is concentrated on children because I'm constantly flying up and down I-5. I have more cases in Snohomish County than I have in Pierce County, which I think is kind of like, what? This is where your home base is. And yet um, we, have, we have tribal members who are living in Nisqually, who are living in Everett, who live all up and down the freeway. And so whenever that happens, then I appear. So I have a unique position that I can see the difference in the way the counties do things. And I have to say, my heart is in Pierce County. You guys have really uh, come together. And I mean, if you're looking at all this, I've never been to a meeting like this before. Look at all of us. We represent the best interests of the children. We care about them. We want to have things be the very best for them. Not to keep them away, not to um, have foster parents. I want this to be a pre-adoptive home. That's not how we work things. We truly have the vision that we want to reunify with their parents. And for an Indian tribe, that means a lot. We want the children to be part of the community. The children, Indian children are raised by the community. That's part of it. And so when they're returned back into their community, that's really the best outcome for them, which is why the Puyallup tribe as a sovereign nation actually has their own children's services program. And the social workers here in Pierce County know them quite well and work with them. But as such, they have the authority. They have their own law enforcement that 
takes children into protective custody, and it works uh, very much like the state's uh, program works also. They have a shelter care hearing within three days and they they track things right along. They have their own tribal court and their cases go to tribal court. So if a child is living on the reservation and, and it's a Puyallup child, the, the state generally doesn't see any of those cases because the tribe has jurisdiction over those children. It's Puyallup tribal members who are living off the reservation that the state sees. So if they're in Pierce County living off the reservation, then they would become the subject of a dependency matter in Pierce County. We intervene on every single case in all of the state of Washington, and we go to every case that we can. I work with Sandra Cooper, who is the liaison between the state and the tribe. She is a social worker, and generally she'll get the first call. And a lot of times she gets a phone call and starts working with the social worker who's looking at a particular family to try to look at some of the resources that are there within the family. So if a child does happen to be removed, it can go to a family placement or it can go to an appropriate tribal home so that there's not a lot of um, three days here and then, and then moving around, that it can go immediately into a native home. And that's one of the great things about having a tribal program also is that they have resources and they have foster care licensing and, and those sort of things. I thought I was going to be addressing a lot of parents who are very distraught at having had their children um, taken away from them. That's, that's what they say to get you in <laughs> and up here. But um, I'm really grateful for the the part that each of us plays. We're so lucky to be so connected with each other too. This really makes me very moved to know that we're all looking out for what we what we can do to support each other and these meetings that people sacrifice their lunch hour for, that's a wonderful thing. And the sacrifices I think that each of us make because I don't I'm sure that I'm not the only one that doesn't get from noon to one and then I'm off at five <laughs> because I'm up at five in the morning so I can make it up to Bellingham for a nine o'clock hearing that is then continued. So I don't know, you guys probably never have that. <laughs> but I do have to say that Pierce County, when I come, we usually have a hearing. It happens. And uh, I think, I don't know exactly what's responsible for that, but I am grateful for it and um, grateful for the part that each of you play. Thank you. <laughs> my name is Pauline Ross, and I'm a veteran parent. And without going into a whole lot of my story and drawing that out, um, I'm a meth addict. And at the time of my dependency, when it started, I had a nine-month-old baby, a 14-month-old granddaughter, and a 15-year-old daughter in the house. My 15-year-old was tired of me using meth, and she called the police. Subsequently, I was arrested and put in jail. My dependency started. So um, now I'm a veteran parent, and I want to preface that with a couple definitions. A veteran parent is a parent who has had a Child Protective Services dependency court case and has had a successful reunification with their children without re-entering the child welfare system or the criminal system. And um, we call birth parents who have had a dependency court case in their past or at the present time birth parents. Dependency 101, 201, and 301 are designed so parents involved in a child protection services court case can build relationships with other parents who have been successful in their dependencies. The programs were conceived by a veteran parent and all classes are facilitated by veteran parents. And um, it starts with shelter care. I go to shelter care and I look at the court docket and I um, speak with the parents that are involved in a shelter care that day. I try to reassure them that I don't know any details about their case except for what they tell me or what I hear in open court. That, that way they feel comfortable and they have confidentiality. And I um, try to let them know that I'm there for support, not judgment, because I don't know any details about their case, but I do let them know that I had cause for a case, that I was a meth addict and I was arrested. 
and that it is possible to get your kids back with work. And um, so then I cover what Dependency 101 class is. I tell them it's an informational class, it's a one-time class, it's two hours long, it consists of a short film, it's facilitated by us veteran parents, two or three of us will tell our stories, and then someone from each department is usually represented and they will tell their role and their job in the dependency process just so they have an understanding of what's going on in their case and how to better navigate the system. And then I tell them they'll be invited to voluntary classes which is 101 and 201, or excuse me, 201 and 301 and we'll tell them more about those later. And the 201 class, what we do there is um, it's more of a support group. We play an icebreaker game, we cover five uh, topics that we feel are really important in a dependency case. Those topics are self-care, healthy support systems, boundaries, healthy alternative activities, and community service projects. And we let the parents talk and kind of unload if they need to. You know, it might be the only place that they have to do that. And then um, as veteran parents, we try to model by positive interaction with the birth, birth parents how being invested in your family is fulfilling and enjoyable. This boosts their self-esteem and gives them hope. And we believe that hope, self-esteem, and cooperation are possibly the most relevant aspects in a success, successful reunification. And we want parents to envision, set goals, and take positive action to achieve a brighter future for their families. Our wish is for birth parents to feel they have a voice and can be viewed in our culture as a valuable asset towards healthy outcomes. Dependency 101, 201, and 301 classes provide a location, forum, companionship, and mentoring to birth parents so they can address their situation and court cases in order for them to feel as if they are not being judged but to know they are supported by people who have been where they are now. And looking back at my, my case, all of these classes would have helped me tremendously. Some of the things that happened in my case was um, I still learn things from parents, other veteran parents, to this day, I didn't know I could contact the guardian ad litem and ask to go to doctor's appointments for my infant, even though I kept hearing through the grapevine throughout my dependency that my infant was malnourished because of me, even though now to this day in her doctor's file, there's no proof of that. Um, I did not know that I could ask for extended visits. My daughter was placed with my brother in a relative care. We didn't know that we could ask for him to be approved to supervise visits. I had one hour visits once a week for pretty much the duration of my 17 month long dependency. And I also didn't know that I could push for my court services. I guess I kind of grew up with the notion that a court process is a court process. What goes on is up to the judges, the attorneys, and the people in authority. And I didn't receive some of my services till 15 months into my dependency, even though I was in total compliance and had done everything I could possibly do on my own to remedy the situation. So, thank you. Pauline. So hope, self-sufficiency, cooperation. I think those are kind of the themes for what we've talked about today for Community Dependency 101. I want to thank everybody who presented. Um, any questions people have? We've got the whole panoply of dependency court here, and uh, you'd probably get five different answers, but we've got time and a lot of suites outside. So anybody have any questions or comments? Want to make? Yeah. I actually have some questions. Okay. Does this occur in Kitsap County as well? Kitsap County in many counties now have this Dependency 101 class. Mm -hmm. um, they don't necessarily do forums like this. This was the result of a brainstorming at an at a administrative office for the courts retreat we had a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we could do it in Kitsap, right? 
Gretchen? <laughs> well, I would appreciate that. Um, the other question I had is um, I was participating in the Indian Child Welfare Case Review in DSHS. And the one thing that we noticed, there was I could not see documentation of notification of tribes when you have an Indian child. How does that happen? You know, the department has a great book that's available online on their website that's the Indian Child Welfare Act manual. And I always tell people coming on the bench, that is a great manual to have access to. It tell, and Pam and I, I break it out. Pam and I got in an argument once, I remember, and I broke it out, and I was, let's see what the manual says. And, you know, this is the attorney for the Puyallup Nation and me going through this. Um, so the department has this guy. They also have, a, what is it, a two-day training that social workers can go through on learning to comply with the Indian Child Welfare Act. Really, the basis of the Indian Child Welfare Act is to maintain the integrity of Native American families. Um, and to keep the, you know, the tribe is part of this process. I've worked with the Northern Cheyennes, Warm Spring. We work with Pam and the Puyallup Nation all the time. And, you know, getting them involved early, not only is it necessary under the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act, which applies to all cases involving Indian children uh, in the United States, getting them involved early, but involving them in the, in the decision-making process so that these kids remain connected. I had a case that went to the Supreme Court with the Northern Cheyenne tribe where, you know, the, the argument they made to the Supreme Court was there's a de different best interest standard for Native American children than there is for non-Native American children. It's an interesting, courts are unsettled on that decision at this point. So the department, I think, does a very good job of training social workers, but it's an ongoing process. Um, we all need to, when there's a tribe involved, we all need to be aware of that and keep the tribe involved in all the parts of the decision making. And I always say, hey, if the tribe wants to take jurisdiction, great, you know? I mean, seriously, because the tribes really, this is a cultural issue. This is, this is um, you know, it's so important to maintain the integrity of that relationship between these kids and their heritage and their background and their future that they may have benefits that they may be eligible for and things like that, that we can actually really help them by reconnecting them with those roots. And that's also the reason we have more, chil more children in um, Snohomish County than Pierce County because we, we like to look at where the resources are and because people live in Pierce County we can transfer those cases to the tribe and they can maintain their resources within the community but up in Snohomish County if we're transferring those cases to the tribe then either the the, the, the parents are having to travel all the way down to Tacoma to get their services or the social workers are spending their time traveling up to Snohomish County or sometimes to Granite or, you know all these places that I'd like to go someday but they're far and that just takes a lot of resources away from the tribe and so I, I think that Pierce County is excellent at getting notice to us. They usually give Sandy a phone call first, so we'll get a phone call first, but then they're good at providing their legal notice along with it. And generally we appear in most shelter care hearings unless we're at a court someplace else. Other questions or comments people have? Well, I want to thank everybody for coming and taking, a couple of you have taken a lot of time out of your day, and everybody else who's been involved. Um, we have a bunch of baked goods, I think, that are some on the back and some are right outside. We also have pamphlets and written materials that people put together. Those are on the outside table, I believe. Feel free to take as many of those. And, you know, we'll be around if you have any questions you want to approach any of us individually after the presentation. So thank you to everybody presented, and thank you to everybody who attended today. Go in peace. <laughs>